The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 11078 in the name of David Stewart on petition PE1458, Register of Interests for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. Could I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on David Stewart to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Mr Stewart, ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. A few short years ago, uh, this Parliament sent me to Johannesburg in South Africa to address a major conference on the role of public petitions. After I addressed the conference, a young American professor took the stage. He told the story of President Kennedy visiting the space agency NASA. During the tour, he talked to an elderly cleaner who was washing the canteen floor. The cleaner told the president they had worked for NASA since its inception in 1958 and that his job was to put a man on the moon. Well, the Petitions Committee does not aspire to put a man on the moon, but to be a window of the Parliament, to be accessible, to go the extra mile for each and every petitioner. Of course, presiding officer, there's no magic wand, but we acknowledge where we've had successful petitions on cancer drugs, on pain relief, and on mesh devices. And I welcome the opportunity given to the committee to highlight to Parliament today the issues raised by Peter Cherby in his petition seeking a register of interests for Scotland's judiciary. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to all committee members and to all who have provided evidence. <laughs> Mr Cherby petitioned the Parliament seeking the creation of a register of pecuniary interests of Judges Bill. His petition was brought to the Parliament at the end of 2012 and since then the committee has been listening to the arguments in favour and against. At the onset, I should say, that part of Mr Cherby's motivation in bringing this issue to the Scottish Parliament was the consideration in New Zealand of a Members' Bill by Dr Kennedy Graham of the New Zealand Green Party. I understand that the Members' Bill there had its origins in the resignation of a former New Zealand Supreme Court judge who was accused of misconduct for allegedly failing to disclose a large debt he apparently owed to a lawyer appearing in a case before him. The Committee's motivation in giving consideration to this issue and seeking time in this chamber to debate is on a point of principle and from a starting point of an assumption of openness and transparency in all areas of public life, if you like, to shine a light in every corner of Scottish society. The petitioner said that the catalyst for his petition was investigations by the Scottish media into members in the judiciary here. The petitioner told the committee that the media investigations had revealed a number of criminal charges and convictions. The petitioner points out that there is a greater public expectation now in terms of transparency and accountability across all branches of public life, and that the judiciary has a duty to be accountable, accountable to the wider community, and it should be expected to adhere to the same standards as those which apply to others in public life, such as MSPs, ministers and, of course, MPs. Now, this Parliament prides itself on being open and accessible. That was one of the cornerstones of this institution, developed by our founding fathers from the work of the Constitutional Convention. We on the Public Petitions Committee seek to champion that approach across all areas of public life in Scotland. I personally, presiding officer, support an independent judiciary. I believe that's a crucial element in the separation of powers between the judiciary and the legislature. And this committee's motivation in considering the petition was not in any way about interfering with judicial independence, but rather it's about reflecting on whether reasonable modern-day public expectations with regard to transparency are being met. For example, presiding officer, prior to the creation of the Supreme Court in 2009, the highest court was the appellate committee of the House of Lords. The law lords were bound by the House of Lords disclosure rules, where financial interests were declared, so there is a precedent. For the most part, Scotland and its institutions have a good track record of openness and accessibility. In exercising its scrutiny function, this Parliament has worked to bring about improvements in these areas. But having a good track record, however, is not sufficient reason to say that we shouldn't ever stop and think about what has been done and how it can be approved upon. We contacted Dr Graham in New Zealand about his bill. He told us that the judiciary there were not overtly enamoured at the suggestion of a registrar of interests. I think a fair assessment of the position here to say that's probably true of Scotland as well, as far as the judiciary are concerned. Dr Graham also told us that the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal testified before the Select Committee on the Bill. 
As members will be well aware, the Public Petitions Committee invited Lord Gill, the head of Scotland's judiciary, to come and give evidence to the committee. Lord Gill declined to attend the meeting of the committee. That, of course, is his prerogative. But the committee is on record as expressing disappointment at not being able to hear from Lord Gill in person at one of its formal meetings. However, I and Deputy Convener Chick Brodie did meet Lord Gill informally here at the Parliament to discuss the petition, and that was useful. When the committee first sought views of what the petition seeks, we were told by the judiciary and the Scottish Government that the existing safeguards in place were sufficient. The existing safeguards are as follows. First of all, the judicial oath, which must be taken by all judicial office holders, requiring them, and I quote, to do right to all manner of people without fear or favour, affection or ill will. Secondly, the Statement of Principles of Judicial Ethics, for the Scottish Judiciary was published in 2010 and updated in 2013, which provides guidance for judges and draws attention to particular areas of potential sensitivity. The third safeguard we were directed to is the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act of 2008. The Act contains provisions to regulate and investigate the conduct of judicial office holders and rules for dealing with complaints about these self-said judicial office holders. Now, the petitioners argued that there's no statistical or analytical information available or made available in terms of recordings about whether and how frequently declarations of interest are made. And I'll touch on that later in my speech, President Officer. I'd like now to turn to some of the evidence received from Mo Ali, who at the time was the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, a role created by the Scottish Government to review the handling of complaint investigations by the Judicial Office of Scotland and to members of the judiciary to ensure that complaints have been dealt with fairly. I know that Ms Ali has moved on and I wish her well in her current and future roles and I'd like to put it on record that the evidence she provided to the committee, both written and in person, was well thought through and thought-provoking. Now, Ms Ali made it clear in her role as the Judicial Complaints Reviewer she supported what the petition called for. Her view was that a register of interest would increase the transparency of the judiciary and contribute to public confidence in their actions and decisions. And I quote again, transparency tends to increase trust. Lack of transparency is more likely to create suspicion. Now that's quite a simple statement, but one in many ways goes to the heart of the issues that we come up during our consideration of this petition. In her view, the judiciary should not be out of line with what is required of others who hold high public office. She told us that she dealt with a complaint concerning a judge who had allegedly used the judicial position to promote a body that was alleged to have breached international law. And in another case, she dealt with a complaint about a sheriff who allegedly participated in a social function organised by a lawyer who had appeared before him at an earlier proof hearing. We did not receive any information about complaints received or considered from the judiciary. Now, presiding officer, a judicial office holder will recruise or decline to hear the case in situations where it's felt there's a potential conflict of interest. Up until recently, there's been no published information about when and in what circumstances recusals were taking place. But I'm pleased to report that after the committee's interest, I raised the issue of the recording of recusals directly with the Lord President. Lord Grill has agreed now to ensure that information recusals would be publicly available. So from April this year, all incidences of recusals and the reasons for them have been published in the judicial website. 14 such incidents have been notified and the move to make more information available is very welcome. For example, in April 2014 at Forfar Sheriff Court, Sheriff Veal personally knew a witness and quite correctly recused himself. However, I am aware that some feel this does not go far enough. The published information relates to those incidents is where the judicial office holder has been recused. What about incidents, no matter how rare, of a judicial office holder not willing to recuse despite having received representation? I'm not that clear where someone could get this information. Is it recorded? Is it available publicly? If not, uh, there's a, is there a reason for it not being available? And I understand from the Judicial Complaints Reviewer that the complaints she saw were more about a failure to recuse, not about the lack of information on the recusals that did take place. Another question that arises is what recourse does someone have when an allegation of a conflict of interest comes to light after a court case has been heard? Is there no means by which someone is able to check in advance as to whether there is potential for any conflict of interest that is likely in a sense to a grievance if something comes to light after the event? 
after a court case has been heard and decided? Could a register of interest avert the need for such complaints by enabling people to make an informed decision to challenge any perception or allegation of conflict of interest at the time rather than after the case um, has been decided? On the other hand, a concern of the Lord President is that the introduction of a register of interest could have unintended consequences and the must be, consideration must be given to judges' privacy and freedom from harassment by aggressive media or hostile individuals. Of course, this is right, but would a register of interest increase the risks that judicial office holders face in this regard? I'm conscious of time, presiding officer. I hope I've managed to set out in this speech some of the questions that I think would be useful for us to reflect on. And in the end, I understand that the New Zealand Bill was ultimately withdrawn on the basis that agreement was reached to improve the rules on recusals and conflicts of interest. I'm pleased that agreement was reached there and on the issues that were discussed openly. I therefore welcome this opportunity to debate the issues raised in the petition and I look forward to hearing the views of colleagues in the Chamber this afternoon. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Rosanna Cunningham, Minister. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate does provide an opportunity to consider issues related to a register of interest for the judiciary, a subject discussed by the P uh, Public Petitions Committee over recent months, as outlined by the convener, David Stewart. Now, of course, it is of vital importance that judges are seen to be both independent and impartial. They must be free from prejudice by association or relationship with one of the parties to a litigation. They must be able to demonstrate impartiality by having no vested interest, such as a pecuniary interest, or indeed a familial interest that could affect them in exercising their judicial functions. And the petition as originally lodged, as I understand it, only concerned a register of pecuniary interests for the judiciary. It called on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create a register of pecuniary interests of judges bill as was then being considered in New Zealand's Parliament, or amend present legislation to require all members of the judiciary in Scotland so to submit their interests and hospitality received to a publicly available register of interests. And of course, that's a narrower uh, definition of the register than uh, I, I think the convener has been talking about uh, this afternoon. The Scottish Government considers that it is not necessary to establish a register of judicial interests. It is our view that the safeguards currently in place are sufficient to ensure the impartiality of the judiciary in Scotland. And these important safeguards uh, are the judicial oath, the statement of principles of judicial ethics issued by the Judicial Office for Scotland in 2010, and the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008. If I could look at these three safeguards in a little more detail, the judicial oath taken by all judicial office holders before they sit on the bench requires judges to do right to all manner of people without fear or favour, affection or ill will. The statement of principle of judicial ethics states at principle five uh, that all judicial office holders have a general duty to act impartially. In particular, it notes, and I quote, plainly, it is not acceptable for a judge to adjudicate upon any matter in which he or she or any members of his or her family has a pecuniary interest. Furthermore, he or she should carefully consider whether any litigation depending before him or her may involve the decision of a point of law which itself may affect his or her personal interest in some different context or that of a member of his or her family. And the, judicial, uh, the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 contains provisions to regulate and investigate the conduct of judicial office holders. Under Section 28, the Lord President has a power to make rules for the investigation of any matter concerning the conduct of judicial office holders. The complaints about the Judiciary Scotland rules uh, came into force in 2011. There was a consultation on these rules last autumn. The Lord President has considered responses to the consultation and new rules and accompanying guidance will be published in due course. In addition to this, yes, of course, Jimmy, do you? The intervention in reaching the conclusion that the introduction of a register of judicial interests would not be appropriate at this time, did the Scottish Government uh, consider and evaluate the Council of Europe Group of States Against Corruption report, which looks specifically at this matter, and did that help to inform the Scottish Government's thinking? 
Uh, yes, Minister. we have looked at that, and I am, in fact, going to refer to that just in uh, uh, one or two uh, uh, moments, if I have the time. Um, in addition to this, members will be aware that from 1 April 2014, the Scottish Court Service has set up a public register of judicial recusals, and the, uh, uh, the convener did mention that. This register sets out the reason why a member of the judiciary has recused him or herself from hearing a case where there is a conflict of interest. And whilst this doesn't go as far as the petition suggested, we believe it is a welcome addition to the safeguards I've already covered. Setting up a register of judicial interest would be a matter for the Lord President uh, as head of the judiciary in Scotland. The Lord President takes the view that a register of pecuniary interest for the judiciary, uh, the judiciary is not needed. Uh, furthermore, the judge has a greater duty of disclosure than a register of financial interest could address. The statement of judicial ethics that I have just... I, I do want to make some progress... Uh, the statement of judicial ethics that I have just referred to says that a judge's disclosure duties extend to material relationships. In his written evidence to the Public Petitions Committee, the Lord President referred to the findings of the Council of Europe Group of States Against Corruption. The Greco Report 2013, uh, following the fourth evaluation report of the United Kingdom, found that, I quote, nothing emerged during the current evaluation which could indicate that there is any element of corruption in relation to judges, nor is there evidence of judicial decisions being influenced in an inappropriate manner. Greco, therefore, did not recommend the introduction of a register of judicial interests. And this suggests that the current safeguards are indeed sufficient and that there is no obvious issue which this register would solve. The position is, of course, different for MSPs and members of other parliaments. We are directly accountable to our constituents and are required to register our interests. Greco also considered issues regarding the prevention of corruption in relation to members of parliaments across the United Kingdom, and they recommended that it is essential that the public continues to be made aware of the steps taken and the tools developed to reinforce the ethos of parliamentary integrity to increase transparency and to institute real accountability. If, uh, if the member would permit me just to move on, I, I do want to get through this. I am aware that this petition was related to the Register of Pecuniary Interests of Judges Bill in the New Zealand Parliament, which of course was considered earlier this year by their Justice and Electoral Committee. Um, and uh, uh, as the convener indicated in his opening comments, uh, the bill did not proceed. The committee, as I understand it, recommended that the bill should not be passed. And following uh, this report, the sponsoring member intended to withdraw the bill. It's also the case that there is no equivalent register in other parts of the United Kingdom. As I've said, we do not think it necessary to establish such a register. The case has not been made that the existing safeguards are not effective. And I can only assume members agree with this, as we completed stage three of the court's reform bill yesterday. That, well, that would be Tuesday. That bill could have been used as a vehicle for legislating for the introduction of a register of judicial interests. I'm surprised that if members are exercised by the issue, that an amendment to this effect was not submitted during consideration of the bill. However, today is an opportunity for a wider consideration of this issue, and I do look forward to hearing what others have to say, uh, and I will come back to perhaps some of the issues in my closing remarks. Thank you. Can I just indicate at this point that I do have a bit of time in hand if members wish to take interventions, but of course it's entirely up to them. I now call on Graham Pearson. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, if I can make some general comments before uh, addressing some of the key issues within this motion, uh, we persistently discuss the need to deliver a fair and just and transparent system of not only government but public law and administration. And in that context, uh, I welcome the petition supplied by Chief, uh, Peter Cherby to the Public Petitions Committee. I also commend David Stewart and the members of his committee for taking seriously the content of the petition and recommending that we discuss it here in the, the public chamber. It does raise issues which cause concern in, in the world generally and can cause concern to some of our constituents. And I think that many of us will have received comments from constituents uh, displaying their reservation in connection with their dealings with the courts and sometimes raising issues. Uh, further, I welcome the opportunity to publicly celebrate the integrity of our judiciary. 
Uh, my involvement with judiciary over the years has been one that has impressed me with the nature of the work that they do and the solemnity with which they approach their very difficult tasks. Uh, that having been said, Moy Ali, as was referred to earlier, the judicial complaints reviewer, had fairly strident comments to make in connection with her work, and she indicated that she felt that, that she had no power to make things different and better. And I think it's worthwhile as thinking for a moment, it's not always the case that this chamber should seek to deal with problems that are identified, but sometimes it's our duty to deal with the perceptions of a problem in order that we can be sure that in the years ahead we demonstrate the fairness and transparency of all that we try to achieve on behalf of the citizens. Lord Gill indicates that from his viewpoint he saw no point in uh, introducing uh, such a register and that he relied on judges being able to recuse himself or herself in circumstances where they identified some form of perceived bias or the uh, reality of a bias being demonstrated that a judge would, in those circumstances, recuse themselves. That places an extreme pressure on a judge to examine their soul before the, the commencement of proceedings and to consider all possible circumstances before that process begins. Until this petition was discussed, there was no knowledge in the public domain of recusals registered. Uh, and I welcome the fact that the Lord President has introduced such a process as of April this year. And I think it fair to say that without the petition and the work of the Petitions Committee, it probably wouldn't have been a stage that had been considered previously. And thereby, I th I'm happy to. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I wonder if the member might agree with me that the welcome addition of the recusers uh, register will help us in future understand the nature or, and scope of uh, the ways in which judges have to stand down. And I suspect perhaps show us that financial considerations might be the least of it. But that is speculation until we see the results, merely a personal opinion. Graham Pearson. Uh, I'm sure that Mr Stevenson's right in, in his uh, a viewpoint, as he's expressed there, that um, I doubt that financial considerations will figure, because all too often, certainly in the media and in, in uh, contents of post bags, it's perceptions of belonging to groups and, and various uh, uh, associations. Uh, and I wouldn't seek to indicate which groups and which associations, mm -hmm. because it merely, it merely creates heat instead of light. Um, but nevertheless, it's that perception that uh, those on the bench are in some way influenced by their, their various connections that uh, creates the concern amongst the general public and some elements of the press. My own approach to these things, and it always has been, is that sometimes, even though you lose an element of your own privacy, it's better to be upfront in these matters and record these things within a register. I understand the threat that may attach to that in terms of the pressures that judges could face in the future. And I wonder if there's a way, once we give some thought to it, that we could create a, a, a register which would not be used by those who would be vexatious to attack or to pursue our judiciary but at the same time give us confidence that our, our courts for the future operate to the best outcome. Um, at that point, uh, I'll close my presentation, but I look forward to hearing what other members have to say on the subject. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Jackson Carlo. Five minutes or so, please. Um, presiding Officer, I've actually found this a particularly difficult debate um, to prepare for. Uh, and so much so I've come with nothing to say. I thought I would listen carefully to the arguments that were 
I would listen carefully, nothing prepared to say, I would listen carefully to the arguments that were being presented and, and then comment. Um, and I want to deal with it in two ways. The issue at hand in the petition and the way, in fact, I think that the Lord President responded to the issues raised in the petition. Now, with regard to the petition itself, I always thought it was a rather curious petition, uh, based as it was on something that might be going to happen in New Zealand. And I was never altogether entirely impressed with it, but I thought that since the issue had been raised, it was perfectly appropriate for the petitions committee to seek to find out what the response of the Scottish Government and the Lord President would be. Uh, amongst my parliamentary colleagues, I should say, uh, without naming anyone, that I've been told quite clearly that we don't want any of that. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but let me say, uh, I think that the Minister identified quite, quite ably um, why, in fact, we should have confidence in the current process and why I'm not persuaded that we do actually need a register of interest. There is the judicial oath. There is the statement of principle in judicial ethics. There is the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act of 2008. And either we take the view that we are appointing and have confidence in the judges that we appoint, or we do not. Uh, and I believe that we should. And I think that Graham Simpson, uh, Pearson started um, hit on the point that what we don't want is to find the whole process of law within the, the court system being um, delayed because uh, issues are being raised as to whether or not the judge uh, has an interest which might be regarded as being one which means they ought to be recusing themselves from the trial and the whole thing becomes bogged down. So I'm not persuaded of the issue, but I have to say um, I thought that the whole way that the petition then developed was less than satisfactory. Now we did hear from Moyella and I want just to quote what she said. She said that she didn't know why there wasn't a register, but it has long been the case in this country that particular groups are harder to challenge. In the past, one such group was the medical profession. I had a look at the website of the General Medical Council, the regulator of doctors, and although I think that it would have resisted this strongly in the past, it now publishes registered of interests, records, family relationships of its council members and so on. At one time, it was difficult for politicians to take on that group. It is perhaps difficult to take on the judiciary because judicial independence is always mentioned. As I said, that is a cornerstone of democracy. But because there has been no separation of accountability and independence, it is easy for the judiciary to say, we are independent, so don't interfere with that. Unless independence and accountability are separated, legislation will continue to include no requirement for more openness and transparency. Now, I thought that was quite a powerful argument. And I have to say that the response of the Lord President was essentially to say, get your tanks off my lawn. And it was all very well to send a written response in. But I thought that if we were going to explore the issues the petitioner raised effectively, and in fact to give weight to the arguments that the Lord President was making, the best way to do that would be for him to have his argument tested with the uh, involvement of the committee. Now, I have to say, in briefing I've heard from the Law Society of Scotland, they don't think the Petitions Committee of this Parliament is a grand enough committee for the Lord President to have to command his attention. If it was a subject committee like the Justice Committee, fair enough, but all manner of petitions could come forward and the Lord President would have to present it himself. Well, that's not the way in which the Petitions Committee conducts itself at all. We thought there was a serious argument here that ought to be examined. And in the language, as you know, that I employed, devoid of any colour, I did myself say that it gave the impression that the Lord President was part of an established, an Edwardian establishment disdain for the right of the hoi polloi, as he sees it, to have any understanding of such matters, and that there was a swish of judicial ermine and velvet that should cow into deference the public and the legislator in relation to our right to understand the issues. And that was what I think many on the committee of my colleagues, I, they will speak for themselves, found slightly unsettling and unacceptable. Now, if we are going to ensure that when petitions are raised, as Graham Pearson said, raising a perception of a problem, where in fact, as the minister has articulated, there is a very cogent argument which would suggest that there is no need for further action, I think the best way is not to suggest private meetings off the record with members of the committee to explore issues within a limited mandate and framework, but that the appropriate way to have done it would have been for the Lord President to come and in a responsible environment 
place his case on the record, allow us to have tested it, and then I think quite in all likelihood have agreed with the principle that he had articulated and thereby have advocated why we thought that was the right approach. We weren't able to do that, and that's why we're having the debate today. I think it illustrated that you cannot simply in the modern age say we are part of something that is independent, we are not accountable to the Parliament for these matters and therefore there is no need for us to make a public defence of our argument. I don't have a problem with the position, I have a big problem with the way that we have got to the point we're at today. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, but I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. Angus MacDonald to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I certainly welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate uh, and not least the opportunity to congratulate the petitioner, Peter Cherby, on being bold enough uh, to bring this petition to the Petitions Committee. Uh, there aren't many who are willing to take on the, the might of the, the judiciary. Um, as we've heard, the, the petition calls for all members of Scotland's judiciary uh, to be subject to a full and publicly available register of interests and the proposal envisages the creation of a single, independently regulated, publicly available source containing current information on judges' backgrounds, their financial interests, details of recusals, etc., and any other information which, which is routinely lodged in registers of interest across all walks of public life in the UK and further afield. Now, given that we as elected members and legislators are expected and obliged to declare our interests, I personally do not see why members of Scotland's judiciary should, not be treated, uh, should be treated any differently. During our deliberations, the committee learned of, a, as we've heard, a similar proposal in New Zealand, uh, as the convener has mentioned. Um, a member's bill sponsored by Green MP Dr Kennedy Graham was proceeding through the parliamentary process as we were deliberating this petition. However, I believe, as has already been mentioned, the bill was subsequently withdrawn following agreement with members of the House of Representatives and the New Zealand Government. Um, now, Dr Graham has explained to our petitions committee that the motivation for the bill was to seek to ensure that judges are assisted through institutional means rather than relying purely on personal direction and judgment in determining whether they should handle a case or not. The intention of the bill was to protect them from accusations or insinuations that their judgment was poor. In addition, it, would, it, would, uh, it was planned that the bill would promote confidence in the judiciary, especially if it shows that the um, judicial system, uh, particularly in Scotland, uh, is above reproach. Now, any member of the public watching this debate uh, this afternoon would be entitled to ask, now, what on earth is wrong with that? Uh, and as I've already mentioned, I'm inclined to agree with them. However, it's fair to say that it would seem uh, the judiciary are not exactly keen on the idea of such a, a register. And at this point, presiding officer, can I join with other members of the committee to, to put on record my disappointment as the committee did as a whole, eh, at the lack of engagement between the full petitions committee and the Lord President, Lord Gill. In the spirit of openness and transparency, which, were so rightly, which we so rightly hold with high regard in this place, it was clearly a snub to the committee when Lord Gill refused to appear in public eh, in front of it. So if it is to be re resisted by the judiciary, it must be borne in mind that nothing undermines public confidence in a nation's institutions and procedures more than a suspicion that a public servant may have suffered a conflict of interest arising from, for example, a financial engagement in a particular dealing in which one was professionally involved. Now, I'm clearly not suggesting that anything untoward is going on anywhere, uh, but surely to ensure no such suggestions can ever be laid in the future, then I feel we must look at having a system which gives the general public peace of mind. Clearly and thankfully, accusations of bias are rare, however, situations of perceived bias are not unknown. However, I have to stress in response to Jackson Carlaw's comments, it's not a matter of not having conf confidence in the judiciary, it's a matter of making sure everything is above board. And I also note the Minister's comments that she believes current safeguards are sufficient, eh, and her observation that there were no amendments on Tuesday. However, as it is a decision for Lord Gill, it shouldn't require an amendment to the Bill. If we, as elected members, have to register and declare our interests, then I see no reason why members of Scotland's judiciary should not be subjected to a full and publicly available register of judicial interests. So in closing, presiding officer, I once again congratulate Peter Cherby on bringing this uh, situation to the attention of the Parliament 
and I hope the Scottish Government and the Lord President will reconsider taking the suggestions of the petitioner on board, which I believe would help to allay concerns of the wider public in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. I believe that one of the fundamental values of the Scottish Parliament is transparency in government for the benefit of the Scottish people. This petition is an important step towards upholding that simple value, honesty. At its core, what this petition calls for is the creation of a register of interests for members of the judiciary in order to ensure fairness in our courts. With the register, when cases are being brought to the court, potential biases can be immediately identified and the potential for a conflict of interest is entirely avoided. The result of this process is simple, fairer and more transparent, where the concern of possible bias is not a concern. Although this as a petition which I fully support, we cannot ignore the need for appropriate checks and balances in order to protect this personal information from being used for other inappropriate purposes. In addition, in seeking to protect the privacy of judicial officials, the register should not be, be used for by a member of the public to contact a member of the judiciary. The information collected for the, this register is explicitly for identifying possi possible bias and with the goal of promoting fairness and accountability, not violating the privacy of a judge. I have always been committed to promoting transparency and accountability in government, including most recently when my colleague Neil Finlay MSP and his private members bill on lobbying, lobbying transparency was introduced in 2012. This bill, which attracted support from across the Parliament, was a great step in the direction of open government. However, over a year after the Scottish Government said that they would introduce another bill on, on this subject, we are still awaiting for a proposal. Just as the goal for the Register of Interest is not to scrutinise the judiciary, but rather promote fairness, the goal of the Neil Finlay's bill was not to make it harder for charities to promote good causes, but to increase transparency of who is lobbying parliamentary officials. Having worked in this bill when it first entered Parliament in the Public Petitions Committee, I keenly advocate for its support. It is a, it is a piece of work which promotes the simple democratic values of fairness, transparency and, and accountability. And Scotland claims continue to emerge of unfair trials ranging from religious, ethnic and national bias. So long as these claims continue to exist, it is the job of this Parliament to promote a fair government. In conclusion, President Officer, I declare my support for this petition and encourage the support of all the other MSPs to do so. Thank you. I now call David Torrens to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Peter Serby for submitting the petition in question and the committee clerk and team for all their work. The debate on whether to introduce a register of interest for the judiciary in Scotland is an intriguing one. It is true that there is currently no such register and alternative arrangements are in place which arguably compensate for this. However, it is also true that registering one's interests is now commonplace among all high office public service personnel and that doing so increases transparency and accountability to the people we represent and serve. This is a point on which I would like to focus, and the main reason why I support the petitioner's call for a register of interests to be introduced. In Scotland, we take a great pride in our legal system, and the integrity of our judges and sheriffs are paramount. We place a great deal of trust in our judiciary, and it's things like the judicial oath, the statement of principles of judicial ethics, and the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 that help us have a confidence that this trust is well placed. However, regardless of the level of trust we have in the judiciary, situations can nevertheless arise that may lead us to question the actions of one of its members and to doubt whether they have acted appropriately in exercising their individual discretionary judgment. The committee's correspondent 
evidence from a judicial complaints reviewer, Moali, indicates that allegations of judicious bias have been made by members of the public in the past, albeit unsubstantiated. Implementing a register of interests would certainly reduce the scope for such doubt and would help to ensure a maximum public confidence in our judiciary. I am aware that every other category of public servant of high office, MSPs and MPs included, is required to re complete a register of interest. It therefore begs the question, why should the judiciary be treated as an exception? Exceptions tend to create suspicion, which is something we should seek to avoid. Completing a register of interest is not an over arduous task and one, in my view, worth doing so to ensure transparency and accountability in our legal system. I'd be surprised if there were many members of the judiciary who did not share this view. In terms of a system of recusal, I understand that it is currently at the discretion of individuals to decide where to recuse themselves from a case. Under these circumstances, I can appreciate that judges may be viewed as having too much autonomy over deciding when to recuse. I am pleased to learn that there is now a system in place whereby recusals made by judges or services are routinely recorded and this, this information is now publicly available via the Judiciary of Scotland website. I thank the Lord President for initiating this action. However, I understand that this development, whilst widely welcome, does not go far enough to address the petitioner's concerns, as it does not disclose occasions upon which a judge decides not to recuse despite the existence of potential conflict of interest. I will, although I understand the conflicts of interest are on occasions declared in open court prior to taking on the case. The introduction of a register of interest would provide a more consistent and sound basis upon which to carry forward across the board. Ultimate priority must be to transparency and accountability to the public. Having examined the evidence provided to the committee thus far, it seems there is a strong case for introducing a register of interest with this purpose at its heart. Considering that there is a, st a standard requirement for all of our positions of high public office, I believe that this is the right thing to do. Having said this, care must be taken to ensure that the minimal inconvenience is caused to judicial office holders in terms of time and effort taken to complete and update a register and to alleviate any ill effects they may have to be put at risk of by doing so. I look forward to hearing the views of other speakers in this today's debate, as it is important for us to gain as many perspectives as possible on the issue in order to ensure that decisions is made in the best interest of public by protecting the privacy of members of our judiciary. Thank you very much. I still have a bit of time in hand at this stage, so I can give the next four members a maximum of five minutes if they wish. Neil Findlay to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thanks, President Officer. The referendum campaign we've just had has developed a, a new healthy interest in all things political, and that has to be warmly welcomed. And of course, with that comes increased scrutiny of politicians, political institutions, the decision-making process, and the people who make those decisions on behalf of the people. The public have every right to know what is going on in their name and to hold institutions and people to account for their actions. And this institution, this institution here, which claims to be open and accessible and transparent in all that it does, and which claims to operate with the values of accountability, openness, power sharing, and equal opportunities, I think is a long way to go until it and the society and institutions we legislate over can claim to live up to those values. If we look at the front to the, the mace there, we're supposed to operate with values of wisdom, justice, compassion and integrity. Well, I think that this proposal uh, is part of a wide range of changes we need to see if we're to live up to those uh, supportable aims. Um, I fully support the proposal for a register of interest for members of the judiciary. We have the right to know whether those involved in determining whether a man or woman loses their freedom has any financial, business, social, political or other relationship that could influence any decision they might make. Uh, currently, there is no compulsion, of course, to declare an, such an interest and we rely on the fair-minded observer test. But that, to me, is wholly inadequate. Um, we have, through history, heard allegations of religious, class, financial politi and political bias, or that members of certain organisations were being helpful to each other during trials. I can think of many industrial and other disputes where, uh, that have gone to court where uh, claims of bias and collusion have been made, uh, and uh, with, I, with, I believe, justification. 
This has to end, so we should have a register with clear rules that leaves no one in any doubt as to who and what should be registered. Is it really a surprise to people that the, uh, we find the legal establishment don't want a register? And isn't it an outrage that Lord Gill had such contempt for this parliament that he refused to attend? Doesn't that simply make people even more suspicious of his motives? Now, President officer, let me give you some more examples of how our politics uh, is, or, or maintains its secrecy. I recently asked a question of a cabinet minister seeking to find out who advised him on certain key areas of policy and was told that information could not be revealed because it was providing information about a third party. So we cannot, for example, find out whether people with links to the fracking industry advise the government on energy or whether people with financial interests in the drugs industry advise the government on new treatments. Um, and these are very important issues. I'm not saying these people are advising them. What I'm saying is that we simply do not know and cannot find out. And I believe that's fundamentally wrong. And what about when the government appoints people to conduct inquiries or write reports paid for from the public purse? Why are they picked? Is it because they're experts or particularly knowledgeable in their field? Or are there other influencing factors as to why these people are picked? What about contracts that have been secured? How and why were they won? What about changes in government policy? Who influenced the change and why? The public should, if they wish, have the right to know what is being done in their name. What about the workings of this parliament? Why do our committees discuss so many issues in private session when there is no reason to? So, for example, why can't we find out why the Health Committee refused to invite the former Auditor General to give evidence to the budget? Who stopped him from coming and why can't we find these things out? Surely the public have got the right to know. And, President Officer, 16 months ago, as Anne McTaggart mentioned, the government said it was minded to legislate my lobbying Transparency Scotland Bill. Yet, to date, no legislation has come forward. Why not? Let me say to the government, if it's not in the legislative programme, then I will be bringing it back to this parliament. And then we can see what commitment this parliament has to openness and accountability. Uh, in conclusion, President Officer, we need to do so much more to make our society less secretive and less of a closed society. I think this register is just one step towards that, that end. I, for one, will give it my full support and would urge other members of Parliament to do the same. Thank you very much. Now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by John Wilson. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> this is exactly the sort of matter that this Parliament should be debating, and it's of testament to the Committee in bringing it to the Chamber. I'm naturally inclined to support a register of judges' interests. I understand the need to enshrine the independence of the judiciary, and I understand Lord Gill's decision to decline the committee's invitation, while it understandably drew criticism. On the other hand, one could argue that the judiciary should not be subject to political pressure. However, I would tend to agree with Jackson Carlaw that he should have come in this in this instance to argue his case to show that the judiciary was not seen as a, as a law unto itself. Um, yes. Stuart. Does the member share my view that on one level there's nothing new about this because prior to 2009 law lords had to declare an interest of the members of the House of Lords. So in some senses we're asking for a reintroduction of something that used to exist and was well established in Scots law. Yes, I, I would agree that's a fair point. Um, perhaps it's because I'm a former journalist that I naturally lean towards increased transparency in all areas of public life. Um, and the committee convener outlined that very well in his opening uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I do take great pride in the fact that there is more transparency in this parliament, for example, than there is in Westminster. No, thank you. However, I have considered the safeguards outlined today by ministers, uh, in particular the judicial oath, um, which I'm sure all our judges uh, take very seriously indeed. I would pass comment that I don't think many members of the public know about the judicial oath um, or, or what it entails. Um, and I would be interested in, to know more about the process which kicks in 
if someone is suspected of breaking the judicial oath, has that ever happened and, and what are the consequences? Um, I've also learned, read Lord, the Lord President's letter to David Stewart MSP with great interest. I wasn't particularly convinced by the passage on practical considerations in which he suggests that it would not be possible to identify all the interests which you know, the subtext seemed to be it was a bit of a hassle. Well, yes, it is a bit of a hassle. It's probably a bit of a hassle for us as well, but it's something that's, that's got to be done. I was more swayed by the passage on unintended consequences, where the Lord President says, consideration requires to be given to judges' privacy and freedom from harassment and aggressive media or hostile individuals, including dissatisfied litigants. It is possible that the information held in such a register could be abused, and these are significant concerns. If publicly criticised or attacked, the judicial office holder cannot publicly defend himself or herself, unlike a politician. I, I thought that was actually quite a, a fair comment. Um, but going forward, I don't think that the, the matter of a register of judge, uh, judges' interests is going to disappear. Um, we have already seen the progress that's, that's being made here and in New Zealand uh, as a result of the debate being opened up, um, even though that's short of establishing a register. Um, I would say that it's very important that all national institutions continue to revise their procedures in order to retain public confidence. And it's very easy, if they don't do that, to see how the public confidence can be lost. Uh, the Westminster Parliament expenses scandal blew up precisely because of a lack of transparency in that system. Um, there was a belief, as I recall, that if MPs, you know, like, were completely transparent in, in what they claimed, it would somehow open them up to too much scrutiny, and that was a bad thing. And in the end, they, they really came a cropper by doing that. And similarly, in, in Westminster, the claims of historic child abuse by powerful establishment figures and how that may or may not have been dealt with by the authorities at the time surely demonstrates that the way things were done 30 years ago is not the way we should do things now. So I very much hope the Lord President is paying attention to this debate. And in that point I made earlier in terms that we have to move with the times, is a, a recurring feature of um, tabloid newspapers to draw attention to the fact of judges who don't move with the times. And one particularly famous incident was in a court case uh, down south when uh, the footballer Paul Gascoigne was... Uh, taking a, someone who had written an unauthorised biography to court. And the, the judge clearly had no idea who Paul Gascoigne was, and his lawyer had to explain that he was a very famous footballer, and the judge replied, rugby or association. Um, so I would, uh, I would very gently suggest to the Lord President, and, and whose gift this is, uh, we can't legislate for it in this parliament, that he should perhaps uh, be mindful of the need to, for the judiciary please. to move with the times um, with every other public institution in order to retain the confidence of the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now call on John Wilson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This petition in the debate today highlights the important role the Public Petitions Committee plays uh, for this Parliament. And clearly the issue under discussion is an easy subject area and is a relatively straightforward one, as many members have already indicated. The resistance to having a general register of judicial interest seems, in my mind, and that of many others, comes from ingrained conservative forces. And I'm clearly not talking about Mr. Carlo in this instance. However, in terms of his impersonation of one of his colleagues, may highlight the conservative nature of the legal profession. The committee have attempted to engage in a positive manner with all those identified by the petition. The same cannot be said of those, all of those who have had an input on the public record. The Lord President, Lord Gill, declined to accept the invitation by the committee to give evidence in respect to the petition based on constitutional principle. And in particular reference to the Scotland Act 1998, Section 23, subsection 7. While this might be considered by some to be a reasonable response, it is undermined by the fact that Lord Gill has appeared before other committees of this Parliament. Principally, there is, a good, is good practice taking place in Scotland. That means the elected members, such as councillors and members of this Parliament, 
have to make undertakings in terms of their own register of interest. So why the lack of positive engagement is essentially a mystery to me, especially when the then Judicial Complaints Reviewer, Ms Moy Ali, supported the petition in both correspondence and excellent oral evidence to the Public Petitions Committee. We already know, and it's been reported widely, that details of shareholdings of those on the Scottish Court Service Board are already in place, and I welcome the information that has been discussed earlier relating to the recusal by sheriffs and judges in cases that they have decided they cannot sit in judgment on. Lord Justice Newberger, President of the UK Supreme Court, in a speech on the 26th of August 2014, actually said to the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondence Club, stated, the rule of law also requires the honest, fair, efficient and open dispensation of justice. And therefore, there is no hope for the rule of law unless we have judges who are independent, honest, fair and competent, and who are seen to be independent, honest, fair and competent. So clearly, presiding officer, we have to ask the question, why can we not have a register? No doubt the associated media coverage covering the non-appearance of Lord Gill to the Public Petitions Committee has led to the title of Lord No-No. It's not something I particularly welcome, although, quite frankly, it does seem to have a degree of merit of an individual who spends six days in Qatar and giving a speech talking about transparency and judicial regulation that lasted one hour while not finding the courtesy to accept an invitation from a mandatory committee of this parliament. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to raise awareness of the petition and the petitioner's work in relation to this petition, which could be dismissed by some unkind types as a boring constitutional matter. But clearly, as others have spoken in this debate today, linking it to registers of interest in other areas clearly highlights the work this parliament has to do in relation to making sure that everyone, no matter who the public are dealing with, is held in high regard. And a register of interest for judges, would I, I would argue, would be one of those areas where we could actually move forward and we could actually see, build more confidence in the system that we have in place. And but to quote part of the speech that Lord Gill gave in Qatar, in his last paragraph, he quotes, he's quoted as saying, one drawback of a jurisdiction steeped in tradition is its slow reaction to change and to modernise. And I think Lord Gill should reread his own words and reflect on the speech that he gave in Qatar, and maybe he could do that same speech in Scotland and actually bring the judicial system up to a standard we would all like to see it holding. As I said, Presiding As Officer, close, this, please, this petition close. clearly highlights the work of the Petitions Committee and I look forward to more challenging petitions being heard by the Committee that can be subject to debate in this chamber. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now call on Stuart Stevenson, up to five minutes, please, Mr Stevenson, after which move the closing speeches. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me start by congratulating Peter Cherby for bringing this forward, because whatever position we take on the substance of his petition, I think it's opportune that we have the opportunity to debate the issues around this, because they are far from being uh, trivial, far from being process, they go to the very heart of trust in the uh, justice system. Um, and just for the record, I'm not speaking in any sense today as the convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, but as an individual uh, member of the Parliament. I, I, I heard uh, with some uh, grave misgivings uh, how Jackson Carlow introduced uh, uh, his contribution by saying he had really nothing to say. And I wondered if this uh, particular debate was going to turn out to be one of these debates because real political debates are not over when everything's been said. They're only over when everybody's said it. But so far, everybody has made an individual contribution and I think that's, that's been uh, very good. Now, I intervened on uh, Graham Pearson for a particular reason because I sort of tried to consider uh, when 
my formal register of interests in this parliament has come into play in my contributions over the years. And I have voluntary things that I put in, as many of us do, because I think, even though I'm not required to, they are things that might matter, like a shareholding in uh, a major bank, um, which is voluntarily declared by me, but is below the level mandating requirement, because that touches on lots of things. But I think when we talk about uh, the kind of interests and uh, connections that a judge might have that will cause recusal, I very much suspect, but cannot prove at this stage, that finance will be the least of them. It will almost certainly, I guess, be relationships, membership of clubs, attendance at events. If, yes? Yeah. Stuart? As always, the member is correct. The, the 14 recusals so far are by and large about relationships. In other words, a sheriff knows a witness, and the member is quite right. There was very few financial in the last 14. I'm most Stevenson. obliged for that. I certainly didn't know that. that was, you've put flesh on my assumption. And we'll see how it pans out when there are more numbers. Um, and of necessity, you can't anticipate and put in a register everything of that carry that's going to come up because your whole life would need to be in the register. I've been doing genealogical research into my family tree for over 50 years. I have 4,600 people in my family tree. How could I put them all in the register meaningfully? So I think we've got to be very careful to not imagine this is the silver bullet. I, I really do want to try and cover one or two things, if I may, Mr. Wilson. If possible, I'll come back. Um, it's not a new issue, uh, the issue of judges. Uh, indeed, if we look at uh, Article 19 uh, of the Union with England Act 1707, it's actually one of the bigger parts of that Act, and it's about the appointment of judges. And in particular, it says, uh, for example, no writer to the signal signet be capable to be admitted a lord of session unless he undergoes a private and public trial if on the civil law before the faculty of advocates and be found by them to be qualified for the said office. So it's not new that we worry about who we appoint as judges. And I think that takes us to the very heart of the matter. Um, the Romans had the, the saying, quis custodiat ipsus custodies, who will guard the guards? And if you've got judges who are misbehaving or not coming to the required standard, how do we deal with that? And inevitably, it's got to be a judicial process exercised by whomsoever who, who, who grips that one. What we've actually got to do is to appoint the right people, because I don't think we can prescribe and describe all the circumstances that may touch upon their ability to make decisions. Now, that is not to say that having a register of financial interests is without value. I don't say that. I just don't want colleagues to imagine that that really does much more than scratch the surface eh, of the issue. Um, we've all got interest. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary has been giving us a budget today. Um, will the Cabinet Secretary be buying a house in the future and therefore will be affected by the decisions that he's brought to Parliament about taxing transactions on housing? And of course the answer is yes. But the real test is that he must not do anything that is other than affecting the generality of people and instead affects him or a group of which he's a member particularly. And I think that's the kind of test that judges have to have in their mind at all times. Now, I'll just close, presiding officer, by saying I do encourage Lord Gill and yes, his must. successors to think about recalibrating the relationship with Parliament. However, when uh, my colleague Joan McAlpin talked about being a journalist, I immediately thought that journalists are entitled to, and properly do, really keep their sources close. secret. So not everything can be in the public domain. And ultimately, we have to choose the right people. We have to trust them. And we have to treat them extremely harshly if that trust is uh, not fulfilled. Presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Stevenson now moves the closing speech. And we call on Jackson Carlo. just under five minutes. Uh, thank you, pr uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I deal with the contributions to what I think has turned out to be an interesting debate? Angus MacDonald uh, said that what Lord Gill had done was to deliver a snub to the committee. And actually, I think it was more that he delivered a snub to the Scottish people, because the committee is the Public Petitions Committee of the Parliament. And the whole point of that 
is that we should be able to allow petitions that are raised by members of the public to receive a proper airing and for those arguments to be tested. And in a sense, we weren't able to test the arguments of the Lord President because he wouldn't engage. And John Wilson's absolutely right. I have it here, a 16-page speech that the Lord President gave in Qatar incorporating the very issues that we'd addressed. Had the committee known, we could have applied to the parliamentary authorities to go to Qatar to hear the speech in person and tackle the Lord President there. If he won't come to the committee, the committee could have gone to him. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mr Finlay? Neil Finlay. I wonder if Lord Gill has reflected on his non-appearance and how he feels when someone doesn't turn up in his court. Yeah. I think I know. I shan't stray there, but I'm tempted. Um, but Anne McTaggart, I think, articulated, as a number of members did, why there is a perfectly balanced argument in favour of a register. And David Torrance talked, too, about how these are commonplace. He also touched on the register of accusals, which David Stewart mentioned, too, which actually arose as a result of the conversations that he and uh, the deputy convener did have informally with the Lord President, and for that, I suppose, uh, we must um, be grateful. Uh, David Torrance said, but that didn't meet the petitioner's concerns, and I would say well, it's actually not the job of the committee to uphold necessarily the petition or the petitioner's concerns, but to evaluate the evidence underpinning it, and then to form a judgment. And that is where I think, again, I say we have been slightly prevented from our um, uh, obligations. Neil Finlay talked about the perception of transparency and he listed the various things and therein lies some of my concern because were um, judges to have to register their religion and that was then thought by somebody who was appearing before a judge as a reason to suggest that there might be impartiality in the proceedings that then took place we would simply paralyse the court system with there being endless reasons to object to the appointment of any particular judge. I hope she won't find it inexcusable of me, but I found I agreed almost entirely with Joan McAlpine's speech this afternoon. Um, because I think she talked about the letter that Lord Gill presented, which talked about the practicality and the consequential issues. And I think that the consequential issues that he identified were the perfectly legitimate counter-argument to the natural assumption that in the modern age there should be a register. And again, I say, had he subjected his reasons to the open test of committee discussion, which would have been perfectly friendly and informed, I believe those would most likely have persuaded the committee on this balance that that was the correct position going forward. John Wilson referred to an impression of one of my colleagues. He might suggest that I did that. I couldn't possibly recognise it as such. Um, Stuart Stevenson talked about the modern argument in all of this, and then, to my astonishment, whoever this Roman was all those years ago, he's been quoted two days in a row in exactly the same quotation in this Parliament. So it's somewhat brought back the fact that nothing is modern, everything is timeless when you come to many of these judgments and issues. I close again simply by saying saying that I'm not myself, on balance, persuaded that a register is necessary. I refer back to the safeguards that exist. I would say, mind you, that we swear an oath too, uh, and nonetheless still subscribe to a register. So it is a balance. But that balance and that argument and that judgment is much more reliably likely to stand the test of public scrutiny if it is subject to proper public debate. And I feel that we are here today because we were not able to do that. Thank you very much. And I call Dr. Elaine Murray up to five minutes or just slightly less. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I can assure members this will be the last time you have to hear from me this week, which I'm sure is a relief to everybody. Uh, the uh, Public Petitions Committee, first of all, is to be congratulated on its tenacity in pursuing this, because there are obviously obstacles put in its way, and, and the, the committee continued to pursue this over a substantial period of time. I personally had been completely unaware until last week when the debate was scheduled that members of the judiciary are not required to publish a register of their interests. If I had been aware, then I might have added it to my list of unsuccessful amendments to the, co the court's reform bill. And I'm sure if I had I done so that the minister would have informed me, as uh, Angus Macdonald said, that it was actually a matter for the Lord President and not for uh, the bill. Uh, Dave Stewart and Rosanna Cunningham both uh, and others uh, have reminded us that there are three safeguards in the judicial oath, the statement of principles of judicial ethics, and indeed the complaints pro procedure. Um, 
and also that members of the judiciary can recuse themselves. That's another word I've added to my vocabulary since uh, going on to the Justice Committee. I don't know if I'd ever have any uh, reason to, new, to use it other than about the judiciary, but they're able to do so anyhow in that that is published uh, as of April. And as others have said, uh, actually, as that is that uh, uh, pu publication is, is added to, we may get more idea about actually why people, judges are re uh, recusing themselves. David Torres and others drew a parallel with members of this parliament. And as Jackson Carlo Gorla says, we are required to take an oath or affirmation. We have a code of conduct and complaints about us can be investigated by the Standards Committee. And uh, I don't think any of us would think that these three safeguards would be sufficient to ensure public confidence. And that's really what's important here. We are required to update our register of interest and to de declare gifts whether we employ close relatives and we're required to register any new interests within 28 days of those interests actually arising. And as Joan McAlpine said, it might be a bit of a hassle, but I think we all recognise why it's important that we're required uh, to do so. The Minister suggested it was we, we are required to do so because we're accountable to the public. But as Neil Finlay said, it's actually the scrutiny of decision-making institutions whose de decisions can seriously affect members of the public. And I think actually, when you look at it in that context, actually the issue about a register of interest from the judiciary uh, becomes more important. Local councillors also are required to maintain an updated re register of interest. I don't know how all councils actually operate this, but I know that in Dumfries and Galloway, when a council has a registered interest in a part of the business of a meeting, they cannot even attend that part of the meeting, still less pay, take part in discussions. They're not even allowed to sit there glaring at their fellow councillors. They actually have to let, uh, leave the room. Uh, I don't think any elected member resents these requirements us and it seems absolutely right that there is transparency an issue that uh, Anne McTaggart raised that, that, which is very very important that any personal interests which might possibly financial interests that possibly affect our decisions are published and they're easily accessed to the public so the public can check up we ours are online it's easy for the public to check up whether we've got, got any particular interests and as uh, was drawn out in, in the discussions around the, the, the committee's uh, that it's not just politicians who are required to register their interests, members of boards of public agencies such as the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Ambulance Service are required to register their interests and in fact three judges sit on the board of the Scottish Court Service and their interests have to be registered. So in a sense that begs the question why not others and as David Stewart pointed out in his intervention members of the House of Lords uh, have to do so and therefore the law lords uh, in the past prior to the instigation installation of this Supreme Court the law lords were expected to, ha to publish their interests so why does the, 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 the uh, situation have to differ for judge judges I realize there's an, a, an issue around um, litigants who are, are unhappy about the judgments and there are maybe security issues and I think the register surely could be drawn up in such a way as actually protect, protected those interests because to a certain extent we're protected we can have constituents who don't much like us or who are upset about, about what we've maybe done or not done in, in pursuance of their cases but our register is there are, are safeguards in our register they can't necessarily find where, where we stay and that sort of thing so surely we'd be able to do the same sort of thing for judges. It is the case, of course, that the judiciary of Scotland are a small band of people. Many of them do, do uh, originate from the same strata of society. And people are suspicious of the old school tie and who your friends are, who your family and fam uh, financial relation, uh, relationships. And as others uh, uh, said, uh, members of membership of certain organisations can be suspected of being influential. And the more that actually that is in the public domain, the more that people can be assured that these things are not uh, actually uh, affecting the way in which judgments are made. George in the George words of Moy Ali, who stood down as a judicial complaints reviewer this summer after her three-year service, given the power, position of power held by the judiciary, it is essentially not, not only that they have absolute integrity, but crucially that they are seen to have absolute integrity. And I think that's the issue. It's actually about them being seen. Not that anybody's doubting their integrity, but that the public can see that they have integrity. Thank you very much. I now call on Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Um, six to seven minutes, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, today's debate uh, has given us the opportunity to discuss issues around transparency and conflicts of interest uh, and whether a register of judicial interests would address these. Um, I, I sense, however, that much of this debate has really been about the process of getting here. Uh, members will forgive me if I don't get too drawn into that aspect of the discussion. It's not really for me. Uh, to, uh, to intervene in the, uh, in the procedures of either committees or 
calling of witnesses, etc. And I'm sure if there are concerns expressed about that, they might be taken up in uh, another place. The debate also did range rather more widely than the, uh, the motion might have suggested it was going to. Uh, and that is understandable. We've heard differing views expressed about the need for a register of judicial interest. And as I indicated, some contributions went very widely indeed. Now, an exchange of views is always welcome. We all recognise the importance of the need to ensure judicial independence and, of course, judicial accountability and, uh, uh, and transparency. But as I said in my opening remarks, there are already key safeguards in place to ensure both the independence and the accountability of the judiciary. And these important safeguards are, to repeat, the judicial oath, the statement of principles of judicial ethics issued by the Judicial Office for Scotland in 2010, and the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008. And this debate has given us the opportunity to put that on the record, that these do exist. We've seen that from the debate this afternoon that if the Lord President was to introduce a register of judicial interests, there's a wide breadth of interests that may need to be declared. As raised by a number of members, amongst them Stuart Stevens and Graham Pearson, uh, material relationships may, in many cases, be more relevant than pecuniary interests. And I think I'm right in saying that it was David Stewart who described a situation where a judge had had to recuse himself because he'd been at a social event as one of the key lawyers in the case. And I, 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 I don't want to misrepresent what he said, but I think that was my recollection. It was uh, along those lines. But frankly, if you take that too far, you'll either have to cloister judges permanently or no cases would ever be heard uh, because the way our social relationships work in Scotland make it almost impossible to avoid that happening on a number of occasions. I'm grateful for, sure. for, uh, for giving way and I understand the point she's making. Could the Minister just say something though about the point I've made a couple of times that this is not all new and before the Supreme Court that law lords register their interests day and daily for generations. So there's an assumption this is all new, this is per not all new. Per Minister. Perhaps the member would allow me to actually get into the speech because I do indeed want to come to back to that particular point. But we've also heard how action is being taken by the Lord President to increase transparency in this area. The Register of Judges' Recusals recently set up by the Scottish Court Service is an excellent example of this, and over time it will give us a better understanding of, of how that process uh, works. Now, I'm sure the Lord President will read the report of this debate and the contributions of various members with interest. So I'm not going to be drawn into a discussion of his decision regarding attendance of the committee. However, as referred to by John McAlpin uh, and others, I'm not quite sure if I remember who, he has warned that the introduction of a register of judicial interests could have unintended consequences. In his words, consideration needs to be given to judges' privacy and freedom from harassment from the media or individuals, including dissatisfied litigants. And if publicly criticised or attacked, a point that hasn't been raised by anybody is that a judicial office holder cannot publicly defend him or herself, unlike a politician. We have the opportunity to respond to criticism. A judge would not. So they don't have the same right of reply that we have. And I have to ask what would be included on a register? If we're agreed that it is far less likely to be financial interests that create problems than it is to be social, familiar and other relationships, uh, it would have to somehow encompass those. But a register including those relationships would be very difficult to compile. Family trees, friendships, all sorts of organisations and affiliations would have to be included. And I think Neil Findlay even seemed to suggest that religious affiliations should also be included. How on earth to know in advance what might or might not cause a problem in a case as yet unseen. And it's interesting that all members contributing this afternoon have avoided reference to a register in anything other than very general terms. But it is equally clear that it is assumed such a register would go beyond the financial. And I've outlined some of the issues I think would arise once it was given closer consideration. Now, if I come to the point raised by David Stewart in respect to the situation in the House of Lords prior to the creation of the UK Supreme Court. As I understand it, that was confined to financial interests. It was not the kind of register that people have generally discussed this afternoon. And furthermore, when the Supreme Court was set up in 2009, that financial register, it was decided, would not be continued, and instead a code of judicial conduct was drawn up. So it isn't an analogous 
uh, uh, register to what has actually been discussed by members. And I think we should understand that. We should also take heed of the outcome of the report of the Council of Europe Group of States Against Corruption. I want to just reiterate that that is an important objective assessment of where we are in terms of uh, the judiciary uh, in Scotland and indeed the United Kingdom. I am aware that others take a different view about the need for a register. The former judicial complaints reviewer considered that it would increase transparency and public trust. Uh, as I said earlier, it would be for the Lord President to establish such a register of interest in his capacity as head of the Scottish judiciary. But as a government, we do not consider that there is currently any evidence to suggest that the existing safeguards are not effective, and we don't consider that such a register is necessary. Indeed, some of the issues that have been raised this afternoon should point to how difficult it might be to compile the kind of register that people think may be uh, appropriate. Now, a number of members did refer to the register of interest for MSPs, but that is very different because we are directly accountable to the electorate. That's why the register exists for us. And even for us, things like religious affiliations are not required to be registered, neither are our circles of friends and relatives, and all the kinds of social relationships that give rise to some yeah, of the great, suspicions in respect close. of judges. So the debate has provided the opportunity to consider all of these issues. I assure you we will continue to keep these issues under review, but our current position is it is not necessary. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mr Brodie uh, to wind up the debate on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Mr Brodie, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as anticipated, I think this has been uh, an interesting, even necessary uh, debate, as, as Joan McAlpine pointed out. Now, let me make it clear, Presiding Officer, that the intent, I believe, of the petition and indeed the debate was and is not to impugn the independence, the integrity or, or the credibility of the judiciary at large. In fact, the very opposite in some of the statements in, in the debate today, contributions from across the chamber, eh, all addressing the words of openness, eh, transparency, perception, eh, clarity, trust, eh, the need to change. All of these uh, embrace, I think, some of the concerns that we on the uh, petitions committee had. The debate, of course, is, as everyone said, is rooted in the uh, petition raised by uh, Peter Cherby in terms of, of the register of interests. And, of course, it did call for a pecuniary register of interests, although it did uh, also suggest an amendment to legislation to submit general interests and also hospitality. Now, it's perhaps instructive, presiding officer, to consider the history of the current position vis-a-vis -vis the register or indeed the production of documents uh, to the Parliament. Section 237 of the 1998 Scotland Act stated that the Scottish Parliament may not impose a requirement to give evidence or, importantly, produce documents on a judge of any court. But when one looks at Hansard of the time, there seems to have been little debate at the general rationale behind judiciary exemption in that uh, debate, except for the current Advocate General, who suggested it should have been and he did at the time, suggest it should have been incumbent upon anyone to attend and compel witnesses to attend and to produce documents. The relevance was that the provision be made to protect the judiciary's position in the Constitution, uh, that the impartiality of the judiciary in Scotland would be secured, and that in the event of a potential conflict of his or her interests uh, with the circumstances of a case, a judge would, not, would uh, necessarily recuse himself or herself from said case. That, of course, relies on the determination of a judge's relevant interest by the judge himself. Uh, uh, but that tends to uh, cover all relationships as the Minister intended to, whereas primarily we were talking about uh, monetary and hospitality considerations. Uh, there are, of course, some safeguards to ensure, as we've mentioned, the impartiality of the judiciary, which might mitigate and temper suggestions of impropriety by members of the judiciary because of a lack of transparency uh, regarding their interests, particularly those of a pecuniary nature. Uh, we've mentioned the judicial oath where the judges swear that they will do right to all manner of people uh, without fear or favour. There, of course, is the Judiciary and Courts Act, which sets out the rules which may be invoked if it is felt a holder of judicial office is not acting impartially. And Section 28 of that Act allows the Lord President to make rules for the investigation and complaints about the judiciary, a matter to which I hope briefly to return before five o'clock. Thirdly, presiding officer, there is the statement of principles of judicial ethics for the Scottish judiciary revised in May 2013, which is to be used as a guidance of holders of judicial office in Scotland. But enshrined in that document is perhaps the basis of the petition, 
and the basis of uh, an understandable perception or indeed misperception, which underp underpins the petition and, and rises and gives cause to concern. Section 4.9 of that uh, Act states, and I quote, however, it is recognised that a judge may from time to time legitimately be entertained by legal professional or public organisations or office holders in furtherance of good relations between them and the judiciary as a whole or representatives of it. What on earth does that mean? It then goes on, furthermore, nothing said here should be understood as inhibiting judges from accepting invitations to give lectures, addresses or speeches of a non-legal nature at dinners or other occasions, or from accepting hospitality, tokens of appreciation for their efforts, or appropriate expenses of travel and accommodation. And that in itself is okay, but I think I know openness and transparency of information would elim eliminate some of the misperceptions that matter. The presiding officer, in addition to these safeguards, we've mentioned the Council of Europe group, the Greco, which stated that it found no element of corruption against judges, but one might argue that that was not the charge, rather that a register might secure the transparency that would make their evaluations uh, redundant. The presiding officer, the petition raised and raises several questions, none of which I would suggest requires a defensive posture. For example, the Scottish Court Service, the annual report, notes that the officers uh, of, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the board, of which three members are judges, already declare some interest in the annual report. We also understand that the SES staff are required to register all of their interests, and I, I fail to understand why that cannot be extended to cover the whole of the judiciary. And secondly, presiding officer, the Judiciary and Courts Act set up the role of the Judicial Complaints Reviewer. And that role is set to review the handling of investigations into the conduct of the judiciary. Now, the previous holder of that role, a role which I suggest should be much more robust and recognised as very important, indicated that in the interest of general transparency, a register of interests of judiciary would likely lead to an increase in public confidence and trust, two of the words I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. And of course, that also extends not just to the SES, but to the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service, who operate a register of hospitality interests, and the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, which publishes a full register of interests of hospitality uh, uh, and interests. Presiding Officer, we accept that the petition called for a register of pecuniary interests, that it recognised that we need to try and capture not all of the other concerns that might arise, as the Minister said, for example, family relationships. And so we accept that in practical terms it might be impossible to capture all interests that might arise or cause concern. The onus should rightly be on the judge or the sheriff to declare any relationship interest at the beginning of such a case and to recuse appropriately if necessary. And lastly, presiding officer, there is the concern that such a register would have unintended consequences, a phrase which has been used often today, for the judiciary's freedom and privacy, or freedom from harassment from the media or dissatisfied litigants. These are concerns, but they are no less so for others, including MPs and MSPs and others in public life, uh, who may be attacked publicly for non-declaration of interests. While it, is argued, while it is argued that the establishment of such a register may have these unintended consequences of eroding public conf uh, confidence in the judiciary, it might equally be argued that its absence may have that very effect. So lastly, Presiding Officer, may I congratulate Peter Cherby, the petitioner. May I welcome the exchange that we had with the Lord President, although I had wished to be in front of all of the committee on this particular issue. And this issue, which I suspect will still be a topic for review, and will be, as Stuart Stevenson said, recalibrated, and perhaps the snub to the Scottish people will be recovered. And I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to discuss and debate this in a meaningful way today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brody. That concludes the Public Petitions Committee debate on petition number PE1458, Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. We now move on to decision time. There's one question to be put, and that is the question is that motion number 11078 in the name of David Stewart on petition number PE1458, Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. 
I know how tough these last few weeks have been for you all, exhausted as you are after the referendum campaign. So take some time out. We'll see each other again in two weeks' time, suitably relaxed and refreshed. Um, I now close this meeting.